Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Tonight at 6, the latest on the search for three-year-old Lena Keel. What volunteers found on day 11 since that young girl went missing. Plus, how a beloved member of the San Antonio arts community is being remembered by his friends and colleagues. But first, new COVID-19 numbers have been released for Bear County. The Texas Department of State Health Services is reporting that since Monday, our area had has had just under 2,500 new confirmed cases. So what that means is that the county is averaging around 623 new cases a day. Metro Health also reporting that more than 300 COVID patients are in area hospitals and more than 70 of those patients are in the ICU. 30 of them are on a ventilator. Meanwhile, across the U.S., we know COVID cases are hitting all-time highs. It is so bad, in fact, that some people are standing in lines that stretch for blocks. Just look at that. The CDC is reporting close to 1.9 million new cases just this week. That means that at least three Americans, on average, are testing positive every second. But there is some good news. A new study from South Africa shows that two doses from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are 85% effective against that Omicron variant. And it looks like it is less severe. It's much more transmissible, which is something you need to take seriously. So as for New Year's Eve celebrations, Dr. Fauci is recommending that people just stay away from large gatherings and focus on small ones instead. Now, switching gears, beloved by the children who would see him perform on stage at the Magic Theater, 51-year-old Richard Solis is among the latest to lose their battle against COVID-19. But the thing is, he wasn't just an actor. Solis was a strong advocate for the LGBTQ rights, and he also was an art teacher. Jesse de Goyado, now with remembrances by those who'd known and worked with him for the last 25 years. Take a look. The actor holding the fishbowl in Cat in the Hat was also the genie from Aladdin. And from the book, If You Give a Moose a Muffin, Richard Solis was the moose. He was extraordinary and one of a kind, for sure. His longtime friend, Debbie King, was one of the founding members of the Magic Theater, along with Solis. That's him on the top right. Magic Theater was founded so that children could see what they were reading in books play out on stage. He and I had a great relationship. He looked at me almost like a father, I know, and, he, and he kind of was like my son. Magic Theater founder Richard Rosen says Solis wasn't just a storybook character come to life. He shared his love of art and theater with his young audiences. Those children Children will never, never be the same. Those who knew Richard Solis say he was very much a part of the magic in the theater's name. Definitely, he is part of the magic in the magic theater. Especially when it came to making props like a turkey out of masking tape, says former magic actor Dylan Collins. Anything that he could get his hands on, he would make something out of it. Plastic bags, duct, duct tape, uh, real estate yard signs. To know someone that creative is now gone is difficult for his theater family to accept. He was just so engaging and uh, <laughs> he was a good guy, man. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Now happening tomorrow, officials at the University Health, along with city leaders, including Ron Nirenberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf, are going to be discussing the spread of COVID-19 in the community and also among health care workers. So this is a conference that's scheduled for 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Of course, we're going to bring that to you live right here on KSAT and on our website, KSAT.com. At the request of her family, the search and rescue SATX organization spent another morning and afternoon searching for three-year-old Lena Keel. So this marks day 11 since that child disappeared from her northwest side apartment complex just off of Fredericksburg Road. Dozens of volunteers gathered at the San Antonio Medical Center jogging trail before they headed off to search a five-mile radius of the Villas del Cabo apartment complex. Maybe we'll find her sitting under a tree dehydrated. That's all I can hope for. Police have been spot on. I mean, I, I'm impressed uh, with the amount of attention that SAPD has, has given this. So I'm, I'm still hopeful. I'll, I'll never lose hope. 
Uh, during the search, volunteers found a plastic bag with bones inside. You may have heard of this, but Chief William McManus said that those bones are not connected to Lena's case. It's also unclear if they belong to a human or even an animal. In the meantime, anybody with information leading to Lena's whereabouts can get a $150,000 reward. So if you know anything, call SAPD's Missing Persons Unit. The number is 210-207-7660. You see it right there at the bottom of your screen. Close call, a four-year-old boy recovering in the hospital after nearly drowning at a far west side home. This is just incredible. Emergency crews got the call around 1030 this morning to the 1000 block of Pheasant Run that's near Tally and Petranco Roads. Officials say the child almost drowned in the backyard pool. And when EMS got there, the boy was unresponsive, so they began CPR. Of course, they took him to the hospital, and now Bear County Sheriff's deputies are investigating what happened. The San Antonio Fire Department says that an AC unit is what started a fire at a northwest side west restaurant. Crews were called around 11 o'clock last night to the Jerusalem Grill. It's on Wurzbach Road near I-10 and the Medical Center area. And when firefighters got there, they saw heavy smoke that was coming from the back of the restaurant. Flames were coming down the roof. And they say the fire started in an AC unit and then just spread to the attic. Now, the fire was knocked out. No injuries were reported. All right, taking a live look outside right now. It's our south side cam where you see just a quiet night right now. 76 degrees, looking kind of hazy out there. And what we do know is that we should spend the next few days preparing because we're going to get a little something, something, Adam. Oh, yeah, we are. Big time cold front going to hit us, and it's going to be a huge and very sharp temperature drop over a short period of time. But that doesn't happen until Saturday night. So we've already rung in the new year. We've gone through New Year's Day and then New Year's Day night <laughs> that night is when temperatures drop. So let's talk about today. Started off at 56, topped out at 82 degrees. That's one degree shy of the record high temperature. Elsewhere, 91 in Catula was the high, 88 in Pleasanton and Carrizo Springs, 83 the high temperature in Del Rio. Here are our headlines though. Still warm and humid tomorrow and even on into January 1st. Actually sunny and in the mid 80s likely on Saturday. Then the cold front hits and within about a 12 to 14 hour period will go from the 80s down to freezing with our first freeze likely on the way. I'm going to tell you more about this and get into the details coming up. All right, Adam, thank you. So this is a battle every 10 years and this go round, the Justice Department is suing the state of Texas over it. We're talking about redistricting and no doubt you've heard the process and you know that it has to do with maps and grouping voters together. But as the case that explains team has covered, it's much more complicated than that. Here's Myra Arthur. It happens once a decade, every time a new U.S. Census comes around. Redistricting has to do with the boundaries that are drawn for our election districts. So anything that we elect by district could be state representatives, state senate, congress, school board, city council. All of those districts get redrawn every 10 years after the census to make sure that there are roughly the same number of people from district to district, and that creates equality of representation. Or at least that's the idea. We'll get back to that in just a minute. Redistricting relies heavily on population. As more people move to Texas, more representation heads to Congress. Some states that are not growing as fast as others are going to lose congressional seats, and Texas is going to be the largest gainer. Texas gained two congressional seats thanks to the 2020 census. The state's population is now 29,145,505 people. That's a gain of roughly 4 million people since the previous census in 2010. In case you're wondering, Bear County grew by about 295,000 people. Texas lawmakers used the new numbers to create a new map of political districts, breaking all of us up into groups and making adjustments for those two new congressional seats. That's redistricting. What comes after the map is made gets messy. Almost immediately, lawsuits were filed to challenge it. Latinos accounted for half the population growth in Texas. Many of the legal challenges claim the Republican-controlled legislature intentionally divided up minority communities when making the new maps. 
and that's called gerrymandering. It's been around as long as there have been elections. Gerrymandering is a term that people came up with to describe when district lines are drawn in a way that somebody considers to be unfair. The term dates back to 1812, when Massachusetts Governor Elbridge Gerry signed a redistricting bill. According to the Smithsonian, up until then, political districts followed county boundaries. But Gary's party, the Democratic Republicans, got the idea to go outside the lines. They made a new Senate map that looked weird. One district, some thought, was shaped like a salamander. That led to a satirical cartoon of a mythical creature dubbed a gerrymander. Somewhere along the way, gerrymander became gerrymander, and here we are still talking about it today. There are two main tactics of gerrymandering, grouping certain kinds of voters together, that's called packing constituencies, or dividing them, that's called cracking constituencies. This group of yellow and purple blocks needs to be divided into four groups. There are some straightforward ways to divvy them up, like this, or even this, or this. But let's say the yellow party is in power and they want a way to dilute the influence of the purples. They could divide the blocks this way, making sure to pack in as many purple blocks into one group as possible, dividing the remaining purples into groups with yellow majorities. The idea is that if you have a community that you know wants to have a politician that's accountable to them and looking out for their interests, and that community is then carved up through this process, they then are, are not, you know, they may not be getting um, uh, representation. We'll be keeping tabs on how the legal challenges to redistricting in Texas affect the March primaries that are just around the corner. To check out this or any episode of KSAT Explains On Demand, go to ksat.com slash explains or scan the QR code on your screen. Look for brand new episodes after the new year. Now, still coming up at 6, the new year, just two days away. Are you excited? Hey, maybe you're planning on lighting some fireworks. And if you are, we have some important tips on what you need to look out for before your New Year's celebrations. That's after the break. Welcome back. A Christmas surge in coronavirus cases. Will it get worse after those New Year's Eve parties? Well, one hospital group already seeing a rise in their emergency room visits and the warning they have ahead of 2022 coming up. Also, our History, Unto our History Untold series continues. Tonight, we're going to have the story of a nun who was called to serve the community of San Antonio. The city of San Antonio World Heritage Office also now recognizing her efforts. We're going to give you that story and so much more when you join us tonight on The Night Beat. Looking forward to that. So now we know that as families across Bear County stock up on fireworks for New Year's Eve, authorities are also amping up patrols because they want the community to know how quickly things can go wrong. Alicia Barrera spoke to a fireworks stand manager on the far west side who says that most products are marketed towards kids and he also explains what parents should look out for. My most popular would be you have Roman candles, tanks, chickens. They're bright, they're fun, and for many, fireworks are a family tradition. It's eye candy for the little ones. Starkey Babila helps run one of the fireworks stands in the city's far west side. Yeah, so they, they, I think they focus big on packaging. So you have things like Pokeball, an ice cream cone, basket of popcorn. So it attracts eyes for sure when walking up. So first thing people, kids notice is a Pokeball. If you're looking for a safer option for the kids, this election right here could be a good start, mostly because they're small, but then they also have a sturdy base like this one and once you ignite the fuse you can walk away and enjoy the show but even sparklers can cause serious burn injuries as they can exceed 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit authorities say stay away from homemade fireworks keep combustibles away and be mindful of what area you choose to ignite the fireworks and we always want you to keep a bucket um, or a, a water hose in uh, in close proximity to be able to extinguish any fires that might arise from using the fireworks. John Ortega, deputy fire marshal for Bear County, says a professional fireworks show is the safest option. But next on the list are 1.4 G-stamp consumer fireworks sold by licensed vendors. Because those are the, the folks that are operating within the legal guidelines of how fireworks are, are permitted to be sold. 
and that goes a long way in ensuring the safety of the product and of the manner that they're stored and, and dispensed out to the general public. You can tell that. These are all precautions to take to avoid injuries, property damage, or even criminal charges. Alicia Barrera, KSAT, 12 News. All right, now we want to take a live look outside a Sky 12 right there, bringing us this lovely live view from the Pearl, where I got to tell you, I'm going to miss those Christmas lights. 75 <laughs> degrees, and it seems like we are getting that Christmassy type weather just a little late in the game, Adam, don't you think? That's a good way to put it. The Christmassy weather, it's a little delayed this year. Our first freeze is likely to come over the weekend, and that would be on Sunday morning. Take a look at our morning low temperatures. We'll be lower 60s tomorrow morning and even Saturday morning. But by Sunday morning, right around that freezing point. So that should be our first official freeze at the airport in San Antonio. Then Monday, I think we're likely to drop into the upper 20s and then we start to warm back up as we get into next week. So a brief freeze Sunday and Monday mornings and afternoon temperatures are going to take a hit as well. Let's talk about everything along with this beautiful Sunset we have this evening. I love this time lapse. It doesn't look like it's going to be anything spectacular until there. The sun peaks out and then you get those nice pinks and oranges reflecting off the base of those clouds. So 77 right now. Southeasterly wind has brought the dew point up to 60 degrees. We're still 83 in Catula, 82 Laredo, Del Rio 81. Meanwhile, low 70s throughout most of the hill country. Temps get down into the 50s in the Panhandle. Amarillo right now at 55, and then as you head farther north, obviously temperatures fall off even more. The jet stream splitting right across the center of the country. Colder air to the north, warmer air, of course, to the south of that jet stream. That jet stream is going to take a dip southward. It's going to pull that colder air south and into our neck of the woods. We're just going to get clipped by that cold air. The core of the cold air is going to stay north of us, but Saturday is still going to be a warm day. We'll be in the mid 80s. It's Saturday night around 10 p.m. to midnight when the cold front hits and it's going to hit hard and abruptly. So high temperatures will be going from the lower 80s the next couple of days, Friday and Saturday, down into the lower 50s on Sunday and Monday only mid 50s, but then we rebound a bit as we get into next week, middle part of the week in the 60s and 70s. Speaking of 60s, those are our dew point temperatures. So it's muggy outside. You notice the humidity and where we've had lower dew points today because of the dry line, the humidity is going to take over. And one thing that's going to do for us tonight is get us back into that trend of thick morning fog. Our future cast indicates this as well and is in agreement of widespread fog to start your Friday, even after midnight tonight, we'll see some developing through Friday morning and by the midday hours, by about 11 a.m., it should start to really clear out and we'll have some sunshine. But those dew points fall off quickly on Saturday and you're not even gonna think of humidity again Saturday all the way through next week. We're gonna get a big break from the mugginess, which means a big break from that dense morning fog and the drizzly dampness that we've had for several mornings this December. All right, latest drought monitor is in and here it doesn't look pretty, doesn't look good around uh, our neck of the woods and especially other parts of Texas. You see south of Highway 90 and west of 281, we've got our deepest drought, particularly Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties. You get farther up into the Panhandle and even along I-20, it's even worse. The activity that's going to be headed our way, the moisture is going to stay to the north of us. Upper level disturbance near Los Angeles. It's been dumping some moisture over California. That's going to slide eastward and it's going to be part of the cold front that's going to be moving through on Saturday night. But you see the rain, the moisture stays to the north of us. At least some part of Texas that needs the moisture is going to get it. However, North Texas could actually have a little bit of snow Saturday evening on the backside of that cold front. So Friday, 63 in the morning, 81 in the afternoon, morning fog and drizzle and dampness and afternoon sunshine, record challenging warmth on Friday, ringing in the new year at 70 degrees at midnight and then 83 Saturday, 32 Sunday morning and only 53 by Sunday afternoon and gusty too with that front Saturday night. All right, let's get ready. All right, so Bob Stoops, Drake Stoops, I mean, huge, huge for them. What a great moment, right? Bob Stoops comes back to coach Oklahoma for just one game, the bowl game. His son, a junior, is a wide receiver, gets a chance to play for his dad one time, and he catches a touchdown with his father on the sideline. How awesome is that? Plus, we caught up with Brandeis volleyball stars Carly Ferris and Jalen Gibson to reminisce about them winning the 6A state championship. Coming up.
Oklahoma beat Oregon 47 32 in the Alamo Bowl last night. And in the process, Bob Stoops and his son Drake shared a special moment. In the second quarter, Drake caught a six yard touchdown pass from Caleb Williams, a jump ball for his only catch of the night. Now, as Jake Drake jogged off the field, Bob greeted his son on the sideline where the two embraced for a special and brief moment. It was great. Um, obviously, I like catching touchdown passes, so that was nice. But uh, uh, no, yeah, it was awesome. It's a definitely a once in a lifetime opportunity, and getting to play one game under my dad, just one game out of my whole career, is definitely something I'll remember forever, and I'm sure he'll cherish it as well. Sooners offensive coordinator Kel Gundy tipped off Bob, telling him the play was coming, so he knew exactly where to focus. UTSA football head coach Jeff Trailer was selected as a finalist for the George Munger Coach of the Year Award as presented by the Maxwell Football Club. Trailer joins Baylor's Dave Aranda, Cincinnati's Luke Fickle, Michigan's Jim Harbaugh, and Michigan State's Mel Tucker as finalists for the award. Now staying with Coach Trailer, during the Frisco Bowl last week, he was rocking a Texas High School Coaches Association cap. So after the game, he told us why he was wearing it. They had sent it to me, and they asked me, if I would do that, and uh, I was honored. One, they'd send it to me, and two, they'd ask me to. And uh, I'm just disappointed we didn't perform better. And it was not lack of effort. Our kids are fantastic, and uh, it's my job to coach them better. End of story. Rocking that cap. Turning to high school volleyball, we caught up with Brandeis seniors Carly Ferris and Jalen Gibson yesterday. Our last chance to talk with them together before Carly leaves for TCU next week. Back on November 20th, Brandeis beat Keller 3-2 to two to win the Class 6A state championship. Trailing two sets to one, head coach Maddie Williams got on her team in the huddle before the fourth set, and it worked. And that's when Gibson took her game to another level. That was the first match I've ever seen her look at me and be like, set me the ball like she was so confident in herself and seeing that you know like I always pep you up I always hype you up but I think just like knowing that she wanted to take care of business and she wanted to finish that match as a competitive setter I'm like okay let's do this thing and it's just being so proud because mentally it was such a great match for her as well as like the way she performed so as her best friend and setter like it was just so fun to be next to her throughout that. Why, why did you want the ball? Why did you want that? <laughs> well, it was my last game. I, um, we were down in the first, we weren't playing our best in the first three sets, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to end my senior year like this. I'm going to give it all I have. And I couldn't have done it without Carly, because um, she sets me every ball. So, <laughs> yeah, just really proud of both of us. They are awesome. Jalen was named 6A state championship MVP with 29 kills and 14 digs. South Carolina football head coach Shane Beamer got the double whammy today after winning the Duke's Mayo Bowl. First, he got the traditional Gatorade shower after beating North Carolina 38-21. Then he received a Mayo bath. Two members of the Duke staff hit Coach Beamer on the head with the bucket before the condiment fell out all over Coach. He laughed all the way and later said, mayonnaise has never felt so good. Not sure that's really a bath you that want. That was a lot of mayo. I mean, they, they could barely even hold it. All right. Wow. Probably smelled really bad, too. Just yeah. saying. All right. So coming up, COVID now sending more kids to the hospital than ever before during this pandemic. And as we get ready to gather with loved ones to say goodbye to 2021, what do we need to know about COVID? Well, we're going to speak with an infectious disease specialist after the break. Welcome back. Unfortunately, we're not going to have a clean slate when we ring in the new year, at least when it comes to COVID. That's because we're seeing positivity rates up, more kids being sent to the hospital. And just this past week, the U.S. averaged an all-time high for COVID infections since this pandemic started. Joining us now to break it all down for us is Dr. Ruth Berggren. She's an infectious disease specialist with UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Berggren, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. And I want to start by wishing everybody health and peace in the new year. I think that that is the most important message that I can give you. But you're right, we're seeing surges. And the positivity rate at the university is as high as we've ever seen it, with 31.5% uh, of the people being tested coming back positive. So this is largely Omicron at this point. And people have gotten the message that Omicron is 
highly infectious, more infectious than Delta, but less lethal. And that is true, but, but Omicron is causing a huge number of people to come to the emergency room to be evaluated. Up to a third of the adults that are coming into the university hospital emergency room right now are coming in because of COVID-like symptoms. Very few of them are getting admitted. A lot of them are testing positive, but they're being sent out. But we're seeing this enormous burden of people coming in with symptoms to the emergency room, which is clogging up the medical system and making it really tough for us to take care of people who have the usual gamut of medical problems. So, so let's address that right now. Uh, l- let's just say for those people who are going to the ER with with, with any other issues, um, what do they do? What do they do instead? Where are you telling them to go? Should they go to urgent care centers instead? Should they go to see their doctors? Right. So if you have symptoms of COVID, the first thing you should try to do is get a home test if you can still get one. If you can't get that, reach out to your primary care provider or go to one of our public testing sites. Put a mask on and don't take that mask off when you're around other people until or unless you have a confirmed negative test result. So you can do a lot of good before going to the emergency room by trying to discern whether you have uh, COVID or not. Next, the emergency room is for people that are really sick. And by that, we mean having shortness of breath, having difficulty Mm -hmm. breathing, very high fevers, and people with those symptoms who also have underlying health conditions that put them at high risk for a bad outcome. Those people are the ones that need to be in the emergency room. That's who we're there for, and we want to take care of you. But if you're not having those serious symptoms, you're better off getting care from your primary care doctor and also seeking a COVID test in the community. So what is that threshold when it comes to fevers? At one point, do you say, OK, I'm not going to go to my doctor. I'm going to go to the emergency room. What's the number that we should be looking out for? OK, well, typically in medicine, we talk about 101 fever as being a high fever. Um, That could differ depending on the underlying conditions of a person, people who are very elderly, um, who have underlying immunocompromised situations, a lower grade fever could be more significant for them. But a high fever, a fever that doesn't come down when you take fever lowering medications, and if you are somebody that's vulnerable by virtue of being old or being on immunosuppressive medicines, um, that's a warning sign that's worth getting checked out for. Okay, so University Health, we know, is telling people to nix those New Year's parties because of the rise that we're seeing in all of these COVID cases. Uh, Yet we know that San Antonio, the city, is still having its its huge party for New Year's Eve tomorrow. And but you're saying that's okay because it's outside. Okay. the problem is that if you go if you get cold and you go inside, or you're in a very, very thick crowd and people aren't masked and they're coughing and sneezing around, this could lead to transmission. So if you're outdoors and you're keeping your distance from other people, we know from studying this disease that outdoor transmission of COVID is really rare. The problem that we're worried about is that people will crowd in together at really close quarters and be coughing and sneezing on each other. If you find yourself in a close crowd like that, you better have your mask on. And it should be a really good mask, like a KN95 or an N95 mask, or at the very least, a surgical mask, a plain old face cloth covering. It's just not going to cut it. Why? Because the Omicron variant of SARS-CoV-2 is way more infectious, much more transmissible than the variants we've been dealing with previously. So put your mask on and stay outdoors. Okay, I'm really glad that you that you brought that up because there is uh, a lot of confusion about the impact of the uh, Omicron variant because we know that the symptoms tend to be less severe. The CDC is now saying, okay, this is the dominant strain that we're seeing right now in the country. So you would think that that would mean fewer hospitalizations, but we're not seeing that right now. Can you explain that? Right, and that has to do with the sheer numbers of people that are getting infected, including with symptoms uh, on top of being immunized already. So, right, we see 
symptomatic people that are breakthrough cases that have people that have been vaccinated. And then you see more serious symptoms in people that were unvaccinated or people who assumed they were protected because they had a previous uh, COVID-19 infection. When you have huge, huge numbers of people getting infected and getting symptomatic all at once, that is what overwhelms the healthcare system. And a, a very small percentage are going to be sick enough to need to be admitted to the hospital, but even a small percentage of a very large number is still a large number, which causes pressure on the healthcare system. And don't forget, healthcare workers are also getting infected. So they're getting right. symptomatic breakthrough cases, and they can't come to work while they have symptomatic Omicron. And so we have a decrease in the number of people available to take care of folks when they're sick. Okay, one last question that I want to ask you, and we just have about 20 seconds left. Would you advise us to take our temperatures every uh, single day after we have all of these gatherings? And just in case we suspect that we that we might be sick or if we do have COVID, do you recommend that we just take our temperatures every single day as a precaution after we meet with our friends and our loved ones? So that recommendation for checking your temperature twice a day is pretty specific to healthcare professionals uh, because we need to make sure we identify them right away and get them out of circulation so they're not infecting sick and vulnerable people. I think self-monitoring for non-healthcare professionals is a really good idea. If you're feeling feverish, sure, go ahead and take your temperature. But here's what's even better. If you've had an exposure or you've been to a party where there's a high likelihood that you were exposed, you need to wear a mask and get yourself tested by about day three to five and get a home rapid test if you can get it or a PCR test to make sure that you didn't get infected during that party that you went to. Please stay away from the parties. It's hard to hear this. We all want to celebrate, but it's dangerous right now. Understood. Dr. Ruth Berggren, an infectious disease specialist with UT Health San Antonio. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, have a very happy new year. Thanks and ha thank you for having me on. All right. And we'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. 642 right now and we're taking it outside right now where it is 74 degrees and I'm keeping a really close eye on those temperatures because a little birdie here is telling us that we're going to have our uh, freeze in just a couple of days and I'm just wondering is there anything in between that Adam? It's going to be record challenging warmth in between so you're making your New Year's Eve plants just fine it's more of the same nothing to worry about no issues and even this evening no issues 77 right now by 10 o'clock will be 67 and then we'll start the day tomorrow close to 60 degrees. So this unseasonably warm weather sticks around until Saturday night. That's when the cold front hits. I've got more information on that and what it means for our temperatures and how much we're going to drop in just about a 12 hour period in just a bit. Welcome back. So our meteorologists have been telling us that in just a couple of days, it's going to get really, really, really cold uh, here in San Antonio. So we need to set aside the plants, right? Take care of our pets, but also we need to have that winter gear ready. The question is for how long will we need it? Well, it's not going to be a prolonged period of cold weather. That's the thing. We're not looking at a big, deep freeze. Nothing like what we had last February. This is a typical cold front for this time of year, and you're going to feel it though Saturday night when it hits. Well, mainly Sunday morning when you wake up. No issues through New Year's Eve and even New Year's Day. Uh, more of the same record challenging warmth Friday and Saturday. Then we'll have about a 50 degree temperature drop within about 14 hours. So that's pretty significant drop with that cold front that's headed our way. And that's why you'll really feel it by Sunday morning. So let's get a look out there right now. Talk about temperatures and what they're going to be doing more specifically. Right now we're at 77. Dew point is 60. And temperatures gradually falling off this evening. It's not really going to get all that cool out there tonight. 79 in Castroville, 72 Canyon Lake, Pleasanton still at 78, New Braunfels 75, still some 80s south and west, closer to the Rio Grande. Catula 83, Del Rio now 81. Let's talk about tomorrow morning. On average, right around 60 degrees, but that means mid 60s closer to the Gulf Coast and some upper 50s near the Rio Grande tomorrow afternoon. Record challenging warmth again. 81 is what we're thinking here in San Antonio, but Carrizo Springs 85. 
Pleasanton 86, Catula 87. Not feeling very uh, New Year's Eve like <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. And look what happens to those temperatures. Talked about low 80s the next few days, and that's record challenging territory. But then by Sunday, the warmest we'll get is about 53. So this is a huge temperature drop. And if you think about it from Saturday afternoon, 83 degrees to Sunday morning at 32, it's a pretty sharp temperature drop in about a 12 to 14 hour period. I mean, we're looking at you know almost a 50 degree temperature drop there. Dew points right now, anywhere from the 50s west of I-35 to 60s east of I-35. The humidity is going to surge back into place and we'll all be feeling it later on tonight. And that's going to lead to more fog development. We've been in this trend with the exception of today of dense morning fog and some drizzly dampness in the morning hours and we don't really shake free from it until the noon hour. I think we're going to see that again tomorrow. A future cast here indicating the reduced visibilities fairly widespread across South and Central Texas tomorrow morning to start the day. But once we get rid of the humidity Sunday late morning, we'll have a brief fog early on Sunday and then we get rid of that humidity and we're going to break the streak of foggy, damp, dreary mornings with very dry air. And actually, if you're susceptible to dry skin or chapped lips, Sunday through early next week. Get ready because you'll with that dry air, you'll notice that on your skin. I do want to point out the moisture. It's all off to the west of us right now. Not a whole lot of it, but this upper level low near Los Angeles that's moving eastward. It's going to help stir things up, push that cold front through our neck of the woods in the days ahead. But all the moisture with it should stay well to the north of us and in parts of well, basically in and around the I-20 corridor around here. I think we're going to be dry. We could use the rain, but unfortunately, I think we'll be dry from the cold front. Partly cloudy this evening, a little bit of a southerly breeze at three to eight. Fog developing after midnight. Friday, New Year's Eve, 63 in the morning, 81 by the afternoon with some late day sunshine. And then we ring in the new year, midnight, 70 degrees. Pretty straightforward, a little humid out there, 70 degrees. And temperatures then on Saturday make it into the lower 80s. Sunday morning, that should be our first official freeze here in San Antonio. And then by Monday morning, we're looking at some upper 20s. So Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening before bed, take care of the plants. Remember, think about the pets and everything else. Pipes should be okay in this situation. And we warm up. I mean, low to mid 50s Sunday and Monday, but into next week, we're in the 60s and 70s. All right. Good stuff, Adam. Oh, Stephania, is this your first Thermometer Thursday it is with me? Indeed, yes. Oh my God, I could hug you right now. <laughs> yes, it, and this is a very special one. Uh, you know, Christmas season, we've got the thermometer ornaments hanging on our tree back here, and I gave away two thermometer ornaments per day uh, from basically Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas or Christmas Eve. We have a very special recipient I want to uh, share with everybody. This is Irene Guerra, who is in hospice care. And her granddaughter reached out to me, you know, told me the situation and said she's always wanted one of the thermometers, you know, can we get one? And this is why I make extras, you know, for situations like this. So we want to let Irene know that we're thinking of her. She's in our thoughts. She's in our prayers. I'm glad her granddaughter Marissa reached out and we were able to make her a very special winner this Christmas season. And we're thinking of you, Irene. Aww. So that's the Thermometer Thursday this week. That is our winner. And we'll be back with our regularly scheduled Therm Thurses next week, I guess. Hard to believe. Wow. Yeah, and congratulations mm -hmm. to Edenia again. All right, thank you. So there's been a lot happening throughout the day, and we're going to catch you up on all the day's news right after the break. Morning to you. It is Thursday, December 30th. That the vehicle that Albino was shooting at was hit five times. On December 1st, deputies went to Albino's home in West Bear County to arrest him, but he wasn't there. And then yesterday, they found Albino in Livonia, Louisiana. 
the U.S. Marshals Task Force arrested him. In other news, we're also trying to learn more about the man who was shot and killed overnight. San Antonio police say that the victim in this case is 47 years old. Someone shot him in the upper body along East Market Street near South Alamo. Officers collected evidence at the shooting site, but they're still looking for a suspect and a motive. Switching gears now with more people seeking COVID-19 testing, University Health is asking people to only go to the ER for an actual emergency because they're saying more people are showing up to the ER to get tested and you shouldn't do that. So they're saying to go to a designated testing site or your doctor. And this is as we're telling you that COVID cases are hitting new highs. They're showing no signs of letting up. Testing lines continue to stretch for blocks across the nation. And despite a decrease in deaths, health experts are urging Americans to be extra cautious ahead of New Year's Eve celebrations. An endangered tiger has been shot and killed in his enclosure in the Naples Zoo in Florida. The tiger was shot after a member of the maintenance crew climbed a fence into an unauthorized area and then tried to feed or pet the animal. They're not sure which one. It all happened after hours. The animal grabbed the man's arm and then wouldn't let go until the deputy came up and shot it. Thanks for watching us. We'll see you on the night beat.